Welcome. So uh, this year's challenge uh, had six levels, and I made three, and Timo Hirmunen made three of them. So I will present the first three. Uh, so um, the challenge was in form of, um, oops, um, you had this information on the web page. Uh, the theme is uh, that we have this crazy taxi driver company called Astley Auto Association that's run by a name, person named Rick Astley. Uh, and they are having all kinds of weird business practices and cheating their customers and uh, yeah. So... Um, from this company, uh, an email dump has leaked, and uh, we are tasked to investigate this email dump and uh, find evidence, or to find more evidence that they are actually bad. So, um, yes. So the email dump contains. Actually, I should click there. So this is the contents of the email dump. We have all these uh, text descriptions, it emails, and then some of the emails have attachments and the attachments are the actual levels. So here is the first uh, email. I've um, made the green ones. Uh, the important words are, are marked in green, so they kind of connect to the, to the actual level. So um, in this case, um, the wealthy customers are happy with the latest taximeter upgrade, and apparently they have some kind of nighttime gaming emporium and uh, they are they they they're trying to hide from the ga gambling authorities as well. So uh, this is what the actual level looks like. Uh, it's an it's a taximeter emulator that runs in it's a Windows program. So uh, and you get the manual. So this is actually a real taximeter that we took the manual from and 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 I I just built something that behaves like the manual and looks like the manual. Uh, so <laughs> So uh, you can uh, determine, you, you can specify the car speed down there, and uh, there is a small debugger environment, so you can uh, uh, see what it's doing. And uh, what else? You, you get this j1.bin. So this is the binary that's loaded into the taximeter, and then on the right-hand side is the source code of the emulator. So it's basically emulating some kind of weird CPU. Um, and um, if you look, if you analyze the code, you can, you can find some words and you can Google for it. And then either you can search for J1, which was the name of the file name, or you can just search for some of the keywords from the source code. And you actually find that it's, it's someone else's CPU called J1. And it, uh, it's a fourth CPU, so it runs fourth code. Uh, fourth code is a quite obscure, well, it's not really used anymore, but it's been actually used for some space uh, uh, programs and stuff, and it's quite, uh, according to, to this, this is just text from the J1 page, they had like completely system with TCP stack and network uh, response to network pings and stuff in just eight kilobytes, so yeah, it's, um, the language itself is stack based and you have two stacks, so one return stack and one data stack. So uh, this means that you can do, it's very easy to return many things and you can uh, do all kinds of tricks with those stacks. Um, yes, so uh, the ta in, the, in the actual taximeter there is a casino mode. So you, um, either you could reverse engineer this or you could just find it by uh, clicking around. So it, since the, it's gambling and it's in the email hinted that it was night, so the, this mode is only enabled during night time. So there is, uh, in the LCD display of the taximeter, you can see that it's night, and that's between 10 and 6. So either you can, if you start the program between this time, or you can go to in, read in the manual to see how, how do you set the time of the taximeter. So if you set the time to this, and it's a wealthy customer, meaning that the taximeter price is high, so you, either you have had it running for a while, or you can click on, like, give tips and stuff so it becomes a high value. And then you press a, a key. Then it enters this casino mode. So it, uh, the text uh, kind of gives away what the task is. It says, get the jackpot. So uh, then in order to get the jackpot, either you can just try to play it forever until you actually get the jackpot, which probably could take quite a long time. 
So I forgot to say, it's, it's actually a, one of these slot machines. So every time you, you press a key, it's, uh, it, it looks like a slot machine. I can actually show you. I have it here. So I've already uh, enabled the, the mode, so. <laughs> and there is some sound effects as well. So you see, the mon this is the money on the right-hand side. So every time you play, it actually goes up, because this is the price. And then every time you win something, the price goes down. Uh, okay, so in order to, to win the jackpot, you have to start reversing the fourth code. Uh, on the right hand side is some of the important things. You can see here that uh, it, it's... Okay, I've, th these are with names. Normally you can't see the names of things, but it's actually comparing the... Um, there is a payout table and it's reading out the value 99 from the payout table. It, it's reading out the value from the payout table and comparing to 99. 99 is the jackpot uh, winnings. So if, if you get 99, it's actually doing something special. It's playing the jackpot sound and then there is, it's going to show a flag. So if you use the debugger to change a byte in the payouts table, so you... Um, you always win 99, or you win 99 for one of the most common uh, slot machine combinations. Uh, then it triggers this flag mode, and it prints the flag. But it seems like it doesn't work, because if you enter this flag in the uh, thing, it will not work. Uh, so there is actually um, integrity checking. So it's actually checksumming itself, uh, and because you edited memory, it fails. Uh, so it's the flag is actually the checksum of the binary. So then if you can use the breakpoint function to determine this is the address of the function that computes the, the flag. So you set the breakpoint there and right before uh, this, uh, when the breakpoint hits, you just restore the memory to the normal value. Uh, and then you actually get the flag. It's printing the flag on the, on the display. So I, I can show you that too. So I, can you see it? Yes, I can move it up. So right now, uh, this is the winnings when this uh, last uh, uh, bar is uh, a ring. So I changed it from 2 to 99. Uh, 63 is actually the hexadecimal value of 99. And then I play a little bit until this becomes a ring that will pay out. OK, I might have to play a long time. <laughs> or I can. Uh, Okay, let me change this. Uh, <laughs> if I also change this to zero, I will win immediately. Yeah. Okay, so now it's probably hit the breakpoint. So I change it back. So it's playing some music, which you cannot hear, but, and then you're winning kind of the jackpot <laughs> thing. <laughs> and then we have to wait until it, it's gonna, it's counting down um, some more times. And then you actually see the flag appearing on the display. <laughs> so it, it, I had never programmed fourth before, so it was quite a challenge to, to actually <laughs> get this uh, taxi meter to work, because it, it has... Okay, now I have to wait for this too. If it has all kinds of features from the... Like, you can add tunnel extras and bridge airport extras. <laughs> you can uh, enter the hired mode. You can select which... Uh, like, if you have fixed fares to the airport and stuff. You can add uh, extras, you can add more extras, you can reset the extras. So you actually implemented all of those? Yeah, I implemented everything in the manual. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. <laughs> but I'm thinking about starting to sell this. It's quite complete now. <laughs> So, uh, okay, uh, then we won that level. The next level is, this is the email from the next level. Uh, so it's, um, 
the email talks about the server room lock, and um, we have a schematic, and uh, we have to reverse engineer a pin code. Uh, so this, you also get this schematic. So it's some kind of keypad um, with uh, a custom chip that's uh, connected to the keypad, and the custom chip contains, uh, you get this netlist of NAND gates. So yeah, it's about 250 NAND gates uh, that are connected, and you can see here what the inputs and the outputs, inputs and the outputs to each NAND gate, and you have to kind of determine uh, what the code is based on how this NAND machine executes. So we have this keyboard matrix, which means that uh, you can see that the row names are outputs because they are the destination pin of the NAND gate. So if you know some electronics, you know that this is a keyboard uh, scanning thing. So it's outputting a one on every row, one at a time, and then reading every time you press a button, it triggers one of the column lines. So here is an example. If, if, if the chip outputs a one on row one and you press the number five, that means that the chip is going to be able to read a one on the call one input. And then it knows that you pressed the key. So uh, to solve this, you can just write the simulator. I wrote it in Python. Uh, so you uh, have the list of NAND gates. You set up the inputs, like the reset and the clock cycle and stuff. And uh, you just compute the outputs of each NAND gate until they no longer change, because then you have reached the stable state. And then you continue doing that and just toggling the clock uh, and recomputing all the inputs. And then you see that it's actually scanning the row bits. So it's outputting uh, a one on each row one at a time. And then it's reading the call inputs, but we cannot see, see that. Uh, so we have no idea how many buttons you have to press. And trying all the buttons could take a long time. Uh, so, uh, But we know one thing, and this is that the ship has to contain the whole state about where you are in the key pressing um, state machine. So uh, every time you press the right key, it's going to advance to the next state. Uh, and that, that's a new state that we haven't seen before. And then w once you press all the right keys, it's going to send out the open signal. So, uh, and if you press the wrong key, it's going back to like the start state, so you can try again. So um, how, how I solve this is to just compute a big hash of the state of all the NAND gates, or the outputs of all the NAND gates, and then we can observe this state uh, by uh, just trying all the keys one at a time. And we see that if you pr for the first key, if you press 8, you get this, and the next state is this, or if you press another key, you know that this is a, the common restart state, basically. So we know that the first digit is eight, and then you can just compute this for every digit. And then here is the complete uh, sequence, which you can enter on the web page, and uh, then you win. And yes? Could you like to brute force it with like a De Bruyne sequence or something like that? Or with the, OK, uh, probably, but it, it's 16, 16, 10 to the power of 16 combinations. Yeah, yeah so it's far too long. Yeah. yeah. So the, the flag there is actually the actual pin code. Yeah, yeah the, so the stuff inside. Like, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. That's a big number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when, uh, we also, one of the solvers uh, wrote this uh, uh, electronic uh, thing, uh, which is actually the. Um, it's uh, pu He's putting the NAND gates on the FPGA. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it, or do you want the microphone? Uh, sure.
Koita uudelleen kuostaa. Vähän saa vielä. Savun hälvettyä. Oh yes! Hey. It's yours. So getting the your laptop to this place of it's it's much harder. It's much 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 harder. Does it work? Yes. Yeah, so all that Python stuff sounded really complicated. So <clears throat> let me give you a few examples. So uh, all of this it looks really bad on the screen, by the way. Anyway, um, so basically when I saw this, I was swearing quite hard uh, because because I knew I wouldn't be able to solve any other challenges uh, except this one. <laughs> because this is the end product I had in mind immediately when I saw that. Uh, but it's okay, I didn't have, to, didn't have to do the other challenges, I just did, uh, <clears throat> maybe overdid this a bit. <laughs> <clears throat> so, more or less, more or less this uh, was, well, it looked like I could write a Python emulator for, for that, but it, for me it sounds overly complicated since what you can do, this looks pretty much like what I have here. It's just the exact same, <clears throat> same stuff as there, except add a few, well, more or less do some magic in sublime text and you get this. So exactly the same, NAND gates, this is the whole module, more or less. I have added a few debugging things there. So every wire here is more or less an output for the NAND gate, so I can put that on the display. And because I was lazy and didn't have 1K resistors, I took the keypad logic and implemented it so that I didn't have, have to use any resistors anyway. <laughs> So tri-state tri logic, and I can detect if, if there's multiple, multiple key presses. Anyway, so getting, getting, getting the code to run is, is really easy. Just, I mean, this module implements it. It's, uh, thanks for the code. That's more or less the heart of the whole thing. Then the only thing is to only implement the display logic, and that's when you get this. So, ah. Yeah, and some glue, glue to actually make it, make it work. It's, it's really, really, really easy, actually, now that you have it there. So basically, once I did that, then, then it's really easy to start brute forcing the whole thing. <laughs> so instead of doing a simulator, uh, you just start pressing some keys and check out, check out if anything's happening there. And yeah, uh, well, the code is currently not the same as what you saw on the challenge uh, answers, but this, <clears throat> I modified it a little bit so Ludde would have some challenge trying this out too. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so first thing that I can see any change is when I hit seven, and there's one pair of pixels that like permanently change, and then you, if you hit something wrong, it resets. So from a few sections, you can see that uh, when, whenever you advance a bit, so it changes a few bits. And when, once you do this enough, swear a bit at 
Uh, when you're at 12 digit, you swear slightly and hope that it's not 32. <coughs> so, and then just do a few key presses, and once you're at 16, you get this. So. <laughs> So as said, simulating this in Python is really, really complex. This is much easier. <laughs> and lo I, I looked it a bit, so I made a graph of all the NAND ports, and at, at that point I decided that I don't wanna. I just do that and it's easy. <laughs> and if you look at, look at that stuff in, uh, like what kind of chip it made, uh, on the FPGA, uh, this is more or less it, so you can't figure out anything out of that either. So, I, I, I really didn't dig, dig too much into it, but <laughs> I, only, I only made this graph so I could make some colors for this event, so I, I, like it's at least somewhat solvable. It's really annoying when there's just uh, black, black or white pixels there. And, as is customary, go, go ahead to GitHub and get the source if you're interested in learning some FPGA stuff. So it's checked in a few minutes ago there. But that's about it. Um, Actually, shameless plug. Uh, if you want to learn, and if you live in Finland and want to learn some FPGAs, I'm uh, hopefully getting a chance to, well, uh, teach some people at Helsinki Hack Lab. Please join, and we have other courses such as KiCad or uh, whatever Hugo mentioned yesterday at hardware hacking stuff. So please uh, visit us at Helsinki Hack Lab. Thanks. Can you come to me? Yes, it's okay. Uh, so then the third level uh, is this email. So uh, he has been, uh, this guy was connect, connecting an IR sensitive photo diode to a sound card to create, I don't know, laser microphone. And then he was kind of spying on, on the CEO of a competing taxi company through, 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 on, while he was in the living room doing something with the smart TV. Uh, so I guess you can guess what it is. But, uh, so you get this um, sound file, basically. Um, it's a 72 kilohertz sound file, so not the standard audio, obviously. Um, you can see that, that it, if you zoom in a bit, you see that, that it has these, uh, like, uh, everything is kind of noisy except these uh, periodic uh, bursts of things. And you get some hints if you if you um, look at the length between two bursts, it's 113 milliseconds. Um, if you look at the length of the one burst, it's 24 milliseconds. So then you can, if you know something about IR, you can just you know that this is some kind of IR protocol, and then you can look on the web for various protocols. And uh, if you Google for RC5, you see that it, that it uses 36 kilohertz and the the sound file was 72 kilohertz, meaning that 36 is the highest frequency it can represent. Uh, the time between two um, um, bursts is 114, and the length of one is 24-25. So this matches the, um, the stuff that we have in the audio file. Um, then if you um, actually look at one of these bursts, you can... Uh, it's Manchester encoded. Uh, according to the RC5 protocol, which means that a, a 1 is coded as a low value followed by a high value, and a 0 is coded by a high value followed by a low value. Uh, so then you can just decode all these bursts by hand. Uh, 
or write the program. And you see that it, it, uh, this is the first burst. The two first bits, according to the previous page, are the two start bits. Uh, the next bit, bit is a toggle bit, which means that every time you press a new key on the, on the remote control, this toggles value. And if you hold the key pressed, it, it just has the same values. So uh, the remote knows if you are just keeping the same key pressed or if you are pressing new keys. And then it's uh, some, an address because you can have many devices uh, using the same protocol. And the last um, six bits contain the button that you pressed. So uh, this is all the this is the value seven, and all the uh, key values from zero to nine are the actual button values from zero to nine on the remote control. So in in this case, uh, the button seven was pressed. So then, if you do this for all the di digits in the in the audio file, you see that it's a list of numbers, and if you pair th these up two by two, you get uh, ASCII codes. Uh, and then if you decode those ASCII codes, you get this uh, message containing the flag. <laughs> so that's all the levels I'm going to present. And uh, we had, uh, I don't remember how many that solved all these three levels, but the most hard one was probably the NAND or the taximeter. The taximeter was solved, one person solved it quite early, but then it took quite a while before someone else solved it. And it was nice that at least one person solved it because I was a bit worried about bugs or, or things so <laughs> <laughs> to make it impossible to solve, but it, it worked. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, Give me just a minute to set up my laptop. And while I'm setting up, you can um, ask Ludde some questions. Don't, don't steal his mic yet. I can, I can start by giving an example. Ludde, how did you like, generate that IR signal? How did you do uh, it? Well, I know what the signal was supposed to be like. So I made a Python program uh, to just generate <laughs> these um, zero and one uh, waveforms and then added quite a bit of noise uh, to it. So uh, and actually, there is an Easter egg in that level too. I forgot to mention. Uh, it's 16 bits per sample. And if you just if you open it up as an 8-bit audio file, an 8-bit stereo audio file, you notice that the left channel is actually uh, a Rick Astley song. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, there was no one that found this uh, Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? And the NAND level, I, I, uh, I, I wrote a Verilog program for the key, keypad logic, and then I found a compiler so I could compile the Verilog into uh, gates. Yeah? OK. <clears throat> so yeah, those were the first three levels and um, in order to solve those you probably need to be a superhuman or something I, I decided to create three more levels that would be <laughs> feasible for also as normal human beings so let's take a look at those here's an example of, of one of those mails that was in the dump uh, like you can read from there I'm a fire all you worthless sacks of shit. This Rick Astley seems like a really nice guy. Uh, PS cancer treatment is not an excuse for missing deadlines. <clears throat> so in case you didn't yet know, it's uh, Henry Lindberg, who's part of the advisory board, who has written this. Henry, where's Henry? There's Henry. So let's give a round of applause for Henry. <laughs> So like, like Tommy said yesterday, all the, all the funny stuff like the call for papers, that's all written by, by Henry. So it's, it was awesome to like, get Henry to kind of set the theme for the challenge. But yeah, um, with this one, mail number seven, the idea was that the Astley Auto Company intelligence division has been uh, gathering some intelligence from a password 
use in the uh, in a, in a um, competitor mainframe. And here's a small part of the intelligence that you get. So you get different kind of pieces of information about the password, like how long is the password, how many uppercase characters, how many lowercase characters, um, how many bits are set on average, and that type of stuff. Um, there's like, I don't know, maybe 100 different hints. I, I cannot recall exactly. Um, and the way to solve this, um, what we had in mind was that um, you, you cannot just brute force this. You need to do something a bit more intelligent. What I had in mind was um, using this um, Z3 um, theorem solver um, by Microsoft Research. So what you can do with this, the idea is, is very simple and, well, okay, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but you can just specify conditions that, hey, these are the conditions that I want all the different variables to meet, and then you can ask the solver that, hey, is there a set of variables that can meet these different conditions, and if yes, what are the values for those variables? And here's an example. So the part that you see here in the comment, uh, that's directly from the challenge, and then below is basically the Python implementation of how you tell Z3 that, hey, these are the conditions that I want to be met. But um, even though this was the solution that I had in mind, there was at least one solver. Was it you that implemented the, this one in C? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> apparently, apparently you can do it that way. So you just need to figure out that what those conditions actually mean, and then you need to be able to derive new conditions. And obviously, when you can get the search base small enough, then then you can at some point you can start brute forcing it. Yeah. And here's the flag. You know the password rules, and so do I. Those who are familiar with lyrics by Rick Astley probably recognize the reference. OK, then mail number eight. Uh, this email is um, actually from Gary, who works for a competitor, but is friends with uh, one of the AAA um, people. and. This Gary guy has um, found a keylogger, USB keylogger, uh, in his own company network, and he's guessing that it's probably AAA who has actually planted that keylogger. And not only a keylogger, but it also um, uh, recorded USB traffic. So you get a PCAP. If you open it in Wireshark, you can see that the protocol is USB, and then you can see it, it's USB heat. So that's what human interface device, something like that. And if you look at the device descriptors, you can see that there's a keyboard device, and then there's a mouse. And what the traffic means, first there's text like this, and then you can see, never gonna give you up over there. I'm not sure did everyone spot that uh, of the solvers. Uh, the way this was visible in the PCAP is that um, there's the word never, and then there's five hits of backspaces. So what I did, I, I was actually, I did manually type all that, and when I typed the Easter egg, I just pressed backspace to erase those characters. And there's the actual email, so somebody at the competitor has been sending email that, hey, uh, we were investigating an incident and we found keyloggers, so in the future, <laughs> don't type anything using your keyboard. You should use an on-screen keyboard instead. So if you have something sensitive to send, don't type it. Use on-screen keyboard and then use your mouse to type the text. So first you probably uh, discovered this, and then the rest of the traffic in the PCAP is basically just mouse movement. Um, <clears throat> What I kind of like fail to realize is that if you look at the keyboard, you can see the Scandinavian letters there, so that's the typical Finnish layout. But this uh, AAA is, I guess it's an American company, so <laughs> in a way it's quite weird. Then on the other hand, they were spying a competitor who could be maybe a Scandinavian company, but apparently for some of the people this was uh, more challenging to solve because they had to also figure out that what's the correct keyboard layout. But uh, come, come on, everybody should know that T2 is a Finnish conference. So. But did someone guess that it's a German layout? Yeah, somebody tried German at some point, but then there was still 
one or two characters failing, so then you had to... I, I think it was the apostrophe that was actually not the correct one. So yeah, all you need to do is just track the mouse movement, see where the clicks are, and then if you plot it on this on-screen on keyboard, you get the key, which is we are no strangers to USB pickup love. <laughs> Again, a Rick Astley reference. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I was just listening to Never Gonna Give You Up on loop the whole time I was creating this challenge. <laughs> Not. Okay, the final email. It's actually quite funny that the order in which we are presenting these challenges, we are going probably from the most difficult one to the most easiest one. And here's the final one. So, <clears throat> again, th this is an email from internal security of AAA. And Mr. Astley had a wish that, yeah, we should track all our drivers to see whether they are loyal or not. And apparently, quite many of the drivers have been visiting Gruber headquarters, a competitor. Um, many of them have also visited MyLift uh, headquarters, another competitor. And apparently, there is just one <coughs> loyal driver. Um, when I was creating the slides, um, I was thinking that what could be one way to solve this. Um, and I, I tried solving this in Excel, because what you can simply do in Excel is that you, um, you specify conditions that you, you filter only those drivers that have all visited the same place. I mean, there is some jitter, so the coordinates are, coordinates are not exactly the same, but if you can figure out that, yeah, there's one coordinate that's really popular, the Gruber, and then there's another coordinate that's also very popular. Um, if you filter all those out, then you get just one driver who hasn't been to either of those. So that would be one way to solve it. But the thing that I noticed was that there's 123 drivers in total. And, and if you add this up, it's not actually 123, so there's actually a mistake in the first number. That should be 69, but I didn't spot that until I was creating these slides. But like I said, um, you get a CSV file. This is how it looks. You can open it in Excel. Um, one of the coordinates is actually the real coordinate of Uber headquarters in US, and the other coordinate is the real coordinate of Lyft um, headquarters also in use. Pure coincidence, yeah, we should have a disclaimer that <laughs> no, no real taxi companies were harmed during the creation of the challenge. <sighs> yeah, and then if you filter out those unloyal drivers, then you figure out that, okay, number 88, that's actually the one and only loyal driver. And if you plot these coordinates on a map, you see something like this. Actually, if you plot any of the other drivers, you get something completely random. And since there's only 123 drivers, you could plot them all and just quickly go through those, and this would stand out. So this is how it looks on a map. If you zoom in and if you add some colors to reflect like the starting point and the ending point, then you get something like this. And here you can see F, L, A, G, and so forth. And the flag, uh, for this level is the birthday of Free Castle, obviously. <laughs> okay, and that's all. Thank you. Okay, so this is the challenge. This is how, what we had in mind as creators, but then I, I think we still have time to hear from the two people, the, the winners, the most elegant and the fastest solvers. So. Um, if you have any questions for the creators or the solvers, feel free to ask. And now you winners, if you want to come here on stage and say something, please do. Or you can comment from the audience as well. Please come on stage. Awesome, now we have a pile of three laptops here. <laughs> yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, I am uh, Carl. Uh, I was the first one to solve uh, every challenge. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to comment on a few of them, especially where my solution uh, differed from 
the presentation here. And uh, I think the one where my solution was the most different from the intended one was uh, with the, uh, um, let's see, where did I put it? Uh, the uh, circuit board. And uh, what I did was that, I mean, I realized that the most sensible solution is probably to simulate this in some way. But um, uh, I wasn't really sure if, like, uh, will it reach a stable state when I advance the clock? And uh, uh, I couldn't find any, like, good uh, simulators, like, pre-made that I could use, and I wasn't really sure on my electrical engineering. But I thought that I'm going to solve this challenge, so um, <clears throat> I will do this, like, by hand. Uh, so what I did, I started just using uh, graph this to um, plot up the whole circuit. And the first thing I got was something, uh, yeah, totally unreadable like this. So this is like a graph of all the <coughs> uh, gates. With uh, I just used a, a script to replace, in every case where the same input uh, went to both inputs of a NAND gate, I replaced it with um, a NOT gate. Um, so, uh, still completely unreadable. Uh, then I tried to like grouping things, adding the... Uh, yeah, you cannot even see it on this one, but I added those uh, external input pins to the graph um, and tried to make any kind of sense to this. Uh, still completely unreadable. Uh, then I started to... No, here I added the external, external inputs. Then I started to try to identify like uh, subgroups here, so for example, if there is uh, a NAND gate followed by a NOT gate, that's an AND gate, uh, and, and things like that. So I, I started identifying, like, you can see things like here and here and here. Um, so I used the graphics to like, group them together, and then I could identify, like, uh, what you call like D-latch flip-flops and groups of those to, into uh, a memory cell. So eventually I got to something like this, so we're getting somewhere. And um, still, this was a little too... Now it's, it's still a little bit too verbose. So uh, I kind of... Uh, this was still, like, completely manual. Like, I modified my, uh, my dot file and just said, like, group these together, color these, and so on. So now, I, instead, I made a, a Python script with some translation table saying that, like, okay, these two should be squashed together into one node, which should be called this. Uh, and then... Eventually, I got something like this. So here we have new colors for memory cells, and uh, so we have NAND gates, NOT gates, AND gates, the external gates, the memory cells. And then uh, I started to look at the, uh, the external uh, pins, like how do they relate to things. Uh, and eventually I was ab able to identify like subparts uh, of the circuit. So um, here is uh, a 4-bit uh, counter which is like the state machine of the circuit. And these output pins is uh, like the counters, and here are the memory bits. And uh, I figured out after reading up on the circuit things that these three together form the, uh, like the input handling. So these are uh, the counters for the scan lines, and they're connected to the circuits here. Uh, and then I saw that this thing here was connected to the 4-bit counter, so I guess this somehow advances the counter. So what we had left was these two rows of, uh, of gates. And by, by naming them corresponding to when they are activated, and they take, basically they take stuff from here and from the counter and combine it... <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, basically, I named this. You can't see here, but uh, for example, I named this one like M zero one zero zero plus K eight, which means that if this uh, if the counter is at number four and K eight is pressed, then this gate is activated. And by doing so, you could basically read the combination of out from, if you just ordered these gates in the right order, you could just read the combination of it. So, um, yeah, that's how I solved this uh, challenge. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, let's see, what's the other one? Yeah, you, you were actually supposed to use C3 uh, for the password one, so I'm not going to show that. If, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the C3 solver, so uh, if anyone was at Secti in Stockholm, I actually did a small talk about constraint solvers and stuff, so um, it's uh, something I like. But for the IR thing, this is just uh, IIF to decode uh, the actual signal. I implemented this uh, graph in the uh, GNU Radio Companion. So, uh, uh, yeah, I actually, um, like the last uh, half year or so, I've been trying to like, learn more about hardware and radio and stuff. So I thought it was an excellent uh, opportunity to, uh, yeah, try to use GNU Radio to decode the signal. And then I did uh, like a Python script for like some post-processing, actually decoding the the protocol into the digits. And I think those two were the actually interesting ones. Um, yeah, here is like the output from my uh, disassembler for the taximeter uh, uh, level. So uh, uh, this is something you should turn off while <laughs> connecting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so it was actually quite a long code. So this took some time to to um, understand, and especially since the the architecture is a little bit uh, like the conventions a little bit strange. One thing they do, which really uh, annoys me, is uh, I mean it's it's sensible. It's like when you have a, a call as the last thing uh, in a function. Instead of like calling the function and then returning, they just jump to the function, uh, which. I mean, it's completely sensible, but it makes like the decompiling a little bit more uh, disorganized. Um, yeah, that was, I think, all the interesting things I had to say. Thank you.